is there a way of seeing um you know who's uh, who's joined or how many people have joined or is that something that that isn't uh, part of uh, we, we we're live now um but we can't we can only see how many people have joined yeah. not in and then through the chats in the question hmm. okay phil go ahead okay welcome everyone hello everyone uh, welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of the 15th of July. Um, for those of you that attend regularly, you will notice that Hadi hasn't suddenly grown a big beard. Um, I'm not Hadi. Hadi can't come. And uh, I'm Phil Varden, so I'm an associate professor at TU Delft, so a colleague of Hadi's. And I have the pleasure of hosting you all today with uh, Sebastian. Um, so I'm also very delighted to uh, present the speaker of today. So Suji Data is an assistant professor of chemical and biological engineering at Princeton University. He earned his BA in mathematics and physics and a, 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 an MS in physics in 2008 from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he earned his PhD in physics from Harvard in 2013, where he studied fluid dynamics and instabilities in porous media and colloidal microcapsules with David Weitz. Uh, his postdoctoral training was in chemical engineering at Caltech, where he studied the biophysics of the gut with Rustin Ismajglov. Um, he then joined Princeton in 2017, where his lab studies soft and living materials in complex settings, motivated by challenges, various challenges like water remediation, carbon sequestration, oil and gas recovery, and targeted drug delivery. So an impressive CV. He's also a recipient of a whole catalogue of awards, and I'm going to say these, I'm going to take a deep breath to get through them all. Um, so the, the NSF Career Award, the uh, 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 American Institute of Chemical Engineering uh, 35 Under 35 Award, the ACS Unilever Award, the APS Andreas uh, Akrivos Award in Fluid Dynamics, the Pew Biomedical Scholar Award, the APS Leroy Apica Award, the ACS Petroleum Research Fund New Investigator Award, and multiple commendations for outstanding teaching. Quite impressive, I think you'll, uh, you'll all agree. Um, so thanks, Suji, for graciously accepting the invitation. Um, for everyone else now, please note that the lecture will last for about 30 minutes and then there'll be questions. Uh, please type your questions into the chat box um, and then Sebastian will hold the discussion section featuring your questions, remarks and a bit of a discussion. So Suji, we look forward to hear your lecture. It's all yours. All right. Well, thank you um, for that uh, introduction and uh, uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, seminar series. I've been um, following this for, for a long time and uh, it's really, truly an honor and a pleasure for me to get to be a part of this uh, pretty inspiring uh, uh, lineup um, and share some of the work that we've been doing in my lab. So um, as Phil mentioned, uh, I've been at Princeton for um, nearly four years now. And today I'll tell you about some of the work we've been doing um, in the past few years, studying uh, this very classic problem of viscoelastic polymer flooding in porous media. And what I'll uh, share with you today is how by directly imaging the flow within 3D porous media, um, we've been able to shed some light on the really interesting physics underlying these flows and um, hopefully have been able to come up with some uh, quantitative principles by which you can uh, try to uh, inform applications. Um, and this work is part of uh, the broader focus of my lab in studying uh, the dynamics of soft and living matter in, soft, in complex spaces. And so I figured I'd just very briefly give you an overview of what we do in my lab before we dive right into uh, the focus of today's talk. And so, you know, we study all sorts of uh, uh, different classes of materials. We study fluids and immiscible fluid mixtures, colloidal dispersions, polymer solutions and gels, and also cellular communities and in particular bacterial communities as a form of active and living matter. And as a community, you know, we've learned a tremendous amount about the behavior of these different classes of materials uh, by studying them typically in homogeneous bulk uniform uh, environments. Um, but in many applications, as you all know, uh, you know, you typically encounter soft and living materials in complex spaces, in spaces with strong structural disorder and geometric confinement and tortuosity, chemical gradients and flows. And these are all factors that uh, uh, can dramatically alter the behavior of soft and living matter. 
And those interactions are what we focus on in my lab. So what are some examples? You know, complex spaces, that sounds pretty broad. Um, you're all very intimately familiar with one class of complex spaces that motivates the work that we uh, do. It's the ground beneath your feet. When you walk outside, the soil uh, under your feet, uh, sediments, subsurface, uh, uh, oil and gas reservoirs, groundwater aquifers, these are all examples of disordered three-dimensional porous media where um, you have solid grains, uh, for example, mineral grains that are packed together, sometimes are consolidated or unconsolidated, and they form a tight and tortuous pore space through which fluids and chemicals and often even cells must move for a range of different applications. So here's an example of an X-ray CT image of soil um, taken from this paper here, where you can see the solid matrix shown by this brown uh, phase here, and it houses this, this tortuous pore space, right? And so we're interested in understanding the dynamics of soft and living matter confined in these tight uh, spaces because we're interested in developing a better understanding of the processes underlying water remediation. Um, better oil and gas recovery, carbon sequestration, filtration. These are some of the examples of applications that motivate the work that we do in my lab. Um, another uh, very different uh, example of a complex space that you are all also very familiar with is the gels and tissues in your own bodies, which are porous macromolecular networks whose mesh-like structure uh, regulates uh, their biological properties and functions. And so I always like to show this image in my talks. This is my daughter, Aiko, who is two, year olds, uh, two years old now. And you can see here, she's um, a happy baby. Um, she's smiling, she's doing what babies do best. She's slobbering all over the place, right? And um, not only is this process incredibly adorable, but it's also incredibly important for her health because mucus is an example of an important biological fluid that is a macromolecular network whose mesh structure regulates how it acts as a biological barrier against inhaled pathogens and particles, right? And so we're interested in understanding how solutes and fluids and cells move through these porous macromolecular networks for biomedical applications. So these are the two classes of problems that we tackle in my lab. And there are three particular areas that we focus on. So one, and this is what I'll tell you more about today, is we study this classic problem of fluid flow in disordered three-dimensional porous media. Typically, you can actually watch what's going on inside uh, a soil or a sediment or a porous rock. We develop ways to make our own model 3D porous media that are transparent. And so we can visualize the flow inside the pore space. Here's an example of oil that's the black stuff in this movie here, uh, displacing water, that's the bright regions, deep inside a 3D porous medium. And you can see it flows through this characteristic disordered fingering pathway, not just as a smooth front. And by taking movies like this, we've been able to develop a deeper understanding of the underlying physics. And so in the past, I used this technique uh, quite extensively to study immiscible fluid displacements in uniformly disordered porous media. More recently, my group has been studying the influence of structural heterogeneities, things like stratification and pore size gradients, which it turns out can completely change the flow behavior. We've also been studying how colloidal dispersions move through and get stuck and redirect the flow and get unstuck uh, in these pore spaces. And so we've been visualizing those coupled dynamics. And then we've also been studying viscoelastic flows and in particular, the flows of polymer solutions. And that's something that I'll tell you about today. And so this is an example of a polymer solution flowing inside a single pore. So here, these black circles are the grains making up the pore space. And what you see here is inside one individual pore. And I'll tell you more about this movie later on. We also study what happens when you have deformable porous media. In the past, I studied this in the context of microcapsules that are often used for chemical encapsulation and release. More recently, we've been studying hydrogels and networks of hydrogels that it turns out can exhibit really interesting shape-changing and self-healing behavior. And we've also been studying how hydrogels behave in confinement, when they're confined in porous media. Uh, and we have a paper on this that came out in Science Advances just a few uh, months ago, and this is something we're actively continuing to explore. And then finally, we not only study, you know, dead matter, non-living matter, but we also study active living 
uh, 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 matter, in particular bacterial communities and how they move and behave in porous media. This is an example of E. coli moving around in porous media. Um, and what we've been doing is trying to understand how being confined in a tight spot changes how bacteria move and sense chemicals and grow and do all sorts of uh, things. So this is another active area of research in my lab. So if you're interested in any of these topics, please feel free to reach out to me or check out our lab website. We have links to all the papers on the website. But what I'll tell you about today is the work we've been doing studying polymers in porous media. And all of the work that I'll tell you about was led by an incredible graduate student in my lab, Chris Brown. Um, in previous work, we studied the really rich dynamics of polymers flowing in microfabricated one-dimensional arrays of pores where we could really precisely control the pore geometry and how they were spaced. And we found some really interesting behavior. We published that in the journal Fluid Mechanics last year. If you're interested, please check out this paper. I will not talk about that today. Instead, I'll tell you about our more recent work studying polymer flows in fully three-dimensional porous media. And some of the work I'll tell you about, um, we put in a preprint that's on the archive uh, shown here. And I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in the details and please feel free to reach out to me. And of course, we don't exist in isolation, but we benefit tremendously from interactions with our colleagues, both here at Princeton and elsewhere, some of whom are listed here. And we look forward to interacting with many more of you in the future. And so, I don't think I need to convince you all that this is an important problem, understanding how polymers flow through porous media. Um, this problem arises in many applications in filtration and chromatography, and more recently in additive manufacturing of various sorts. Um, perhaps of direct interest to this audience, uh, this problem arises in oil recovery, where polymers have been used um, for conformance control and for enhanced oil recovery for many, many, many decades, right? People have also been using polymers for formulations for pump and treat in groundwater aquifers to remediate them. And in both of these settings, uh, conceptually, you have a similar kind of problem where you typically have droplets of a non-aqueous phase liquid, either oil, hydrocarbons, or um, chlorinated solvents, for example, in the case of groundwater uh, aquifers, right, that get stuck inside a porous rock due to capillary forces and the goal is you want to get them out either because you want to recover the oil so you can use it or because you want to be able to recover the contaminants from a polluted groundwater aquifer and further uh, treat the water so you can use it right and so this is a classic problem that people have been using polymers for um, in many ways and i'll touch on that at the end of my talk as well and so in all of these cases, the simplest question, one of the simplest questions you can ask, uh, one of the most fundamental descriptors of the flow is how is the pressure drop related to the flow rate? So for example, if you have a porous medium here, I'm showing you a sandstone core, right? Of a given length L, right? And you inject a polymer solution into that porous medium at a given volumetric flow rate Q, and it has a cross-sectional area A, right? So Q over A is the Darcy flux. It's a measure of how quickly this fluid is flowing through the medium, right? Well, and if you inject that polymer solution at a given flow rate or a given flux, you can measure the pressure drop across that porous medium, across a given length L, right? And those two are related. As you increase the, the flow rate, the pressure drop increases, as you decrease the flow rate, the pressure drop decreases. And typically, these are related using Darcy's law, right? Everything that I'll tell you about today is at very, very low Reynolds numbers, slow viscous flows, because the pores are small enough and the viscosities are high enough so that inertia doesn't play a role. We're in the low Reynolds number limit. And so we often use Darcy's law to quantify the relationship between the total pressure drop across the length L of your medium and the flux given by the flow rate per unit area, right? And these are related by the permeability of the medium, which is a geometric uh, uh, quantity, and the viscosity, which I'm showing here by this quantity eta. And you'll notice this has a subscript APP, that's the eta apparent. This is often known as the apparent viscosity, right? So when you inject your polymer solution, the pressure drop across a given length is related to the flux 
by this quantity, the apparent viscosity, which typically is just given by the macroscopic shear viscosity that you would measure in a rheometer or in a viscometer, right? And typically this is what we do, but we call this the apparent viscosity because this is the viscosity that the fluid would appear to have if you used Darcy's law. And so it's a, a way of quantifying the macroscopic flow resistance. And it turns out, and here's the puzzle that today's entire talk is based on. Turns out that for many polymer solutions, this apparent viscosity is not the same as your typical macroscopic shear viscosity. And the question is, why? What determines this quantity and how do we predict it? Right? This is one of the most fundamental descriptors of the flow, right? Is what is the viscosity of the fluid or what is the apparent macroscopic viscosity? And it turns out that for polymer solutions and porous media, it's actually really complicated. And so hopefully today what I'll share with you is how by directly visualizing the flow and by measuring the macroscopic uh, flow resistance, we've been able to link the two together, right? And so we got interested in this uh, puzzle because we're reading this classic literature um, dating back to the 60s. Marshall and Metzner at the University of Delaware did these beautiful experiments uh, where they just took high molecular weight polymer solutions, injected them into a porous medium, right? And they found that the apparent viscosity was something unexpected, right? And so later work by Chavateau in the 80s um, uh, quantified this beautifully. So here's a plot from Chavateau's paper using uh, partially hydrolyzed polyacrylamide in a salt solution. So this is the same polymer that's often used in the field. And indeed, this is the polymer that we use in our work. Right? This is a high molecular weight polymer. These different curves are different uh, concentrations of the polymer. And what Chavito is showing here is, if you just take the measured shear viscosity right, of the polymer solution, if you measure it in a rheometer, that's shown by the open symbols here. Typically, a high molecular weight polymer solutions are shear thinning. That is, the viscosity goes down as you increase shear rate. Right? But the weird thing is that if instead you just measure the pressure drop across a porous medium as you're injecting this polymer solution, right? And determine the apparent viscosity using Darcy's law. It turns out that at low flow rates or low shear rates, the apparent viscosity, which is shown by the solid symbols, agrees with your shear viscosity, which is typically the case, but above a threshold shear rate, which corresponds to a threshold flow rate, that apparent viscosity anomalously increases. Right, you can see it can be quite sharp, right? The macroscopic flow resistance inside this porous medium anomalously increases. And the question is why? And for over 50 years, this has still been an open uh, question. And so many different mechanisms have been proposed, right? Chavateau, indeed, in this uh, early paper, suggested that, well, as these polymers are going through these converging sections of the pores, they get stretched out. Right, and that gives rise to an extensional viscosity, perhaps that increases the anomalous uh, macro uh, th that increases the macroscopic flow resistance. Others have suggested that, well, as you're stretching these polymers out, there are more ways in which they can contact the surrounding solid matrix, and they can get stuck and plug the pores and reduce the permeability of the medium. And of course, that's going to increase your macroscopic uh, flow resistance. More recently, Andy Clark's group at Schlumberger has done a beautiful job showing how, you know, with a lot of these high molecular weight polymer solutions, due to the polymer elasticity, right, it turns out that the flow can appear to become turbulent. Typically, at low Reynolds numbers, we think of these flows as being laminar, smooth, unchanging in time. But it turns out that due to the polymer elasticity, because it takes some time for the elastic stresses as these polymer chains are stretched out to relax, right? At sufficiently high flow rates, these flows can appear to become turbulent, even though inertia doesn't play a role. So this is a phenomenon that's known as elastic turbulence. And Andy Clark's group has shown in these beautiful 2D micro model experiments that the flows can indeed become unstable and turbulent. And they've also seen indications of this in 3D uh, measurements, right? And so then the question is, perhaps uh, the, this elastic turbulence is giving rise to additional fluctuations that 
generate this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance? We don't know. In more recent work, Jeff Guasso's group kind of shed a little, uh, uh, put a little wrench into this uh, uh, hypothesis by showing that even though in ordered arrays of cylinders in 2D micromodels, you do get these flow fluctuations shown by this color plot here. If you introduce a disorder into that ordered array, and disorder is inherent in most natural uh, porous media, in some cases, disorder can actually suppress this chaotic elastic turbulent flow, right? And it still remains stable. So maybe elastic turbulence doesn't arise in disordered porous media. And then even more recently, just a few weeks ago, actually, Simon Howard and Amy Shen and uh, co-workers put this beautiful preprint on the archive where they showed that actually this is not a general principle. In some cases, depending on the arrangement of these cylinders in 2D micromodels, disorder could promote the onset of elastic turbulence, or in other cases, it could suppress it. So it's really complicated. The question is, does elastic turbulence even arise in 3D porous media? We don't know. And so I'm just going to jump to today's punchline. What we found by directly visualizing the flow in disordered 3D porous media, we have found that elastic turbulence does arise inside the pore space. And by we've been able to quantitatively link the features of that chaotic flow field to this anomalous increase in the flow resistance. So you don't need these other mechanisms to be able to explain it, although they may indeed arise in many different settings. But these chaotic flow fluctuations generated by what's called elastic turbulence give rise to this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance. And so we're excited about this work because we think it provides quantitative guidelines for various applications of polymers where you want to be able to know what the viscosity is. And it also suggests future directions by which we might be able to understand how polymers enhance the mobilization of trapped fluids. And so I'll touch on that at the very end of the talk. So how do we do this? How do we actually watch what's going on inside a 3D porous medium? So the way we do this is we make our own model 3D porous media. We take uh, borosilicate glass beads of a given uh, mean diameter and size distribution. We pack them together inside a quartz capillary. Uh, typically, these are tens of beads across, hundreds of beads along, right? The bead diameters are typically hundreds of micrometers, so the pore sizes are tens of microns in size, right? And then we sinter them very uh, quickly inside a furnace at 1,000 degrees Celsius. So they fuse together, and so you have a static matrix that doesn't rearrange. Right? So that's our model porous medium where we can control very nicely how the beads are arranged and uh, what the mean uh, pore size is and what the pore size distribution is. But that's still opaque. Here's an example of one of these packings. We're looking top down at it. Right, You still can't see what's going on inside of it. And to be able to actually watch the flow, we came up with a trick. We use a trick that's commonly used in many other applications. We formulate refractive index matched fluids right? So that when you infiltrate the pore space, everything becomes transparent. You no longer have light scattering off the interfaces. I promise you this, the porous medium is still here, but now we've infil infiltrated the pore space with a refractive index match fluid. So you can see right through it, right? And so by selectively dyeing different components with fluorescent dyes, we, we can actually visualize the pore space geometry and the flow inside the 3D pore space, right? And so we use confocal microscopy. We can take sections through the pore space. Here's an example where the bright regions are the pore space filled with a dyed fluid. The black circles are cuts through the grains making up this packing. We can put them together, reconstruct the 3D uh, structure of the packing, and we can also visualize the flow using seeded tracer particles, right? So this is an approach that we've used in many, many different studies in my lab, studying colloids and polymers and fluid flow. Um, please feel free to check out some of these references. And so to study polymer solutions, we formulated an index matched polymer formulation. And we also instrument these porous media so we can measure the pressure drop. So we can connect the pore scale flow features to the overall macroscopic flow resistance. 
And so the polymer that we use is this typical partially hydrolyzed polyacrylamide. It's a high molecular weight polymer. We put it in a solvent that's very viscous, right? So it's a, a, a viscous background solvent and it's index matched, right? So this is what's often known as a Boger fluid. The shear viscosity is roughly constant over the range of shear rates that we test. We can also measure the first normal stress difference, which is a measure of how elastic this fluid is, right? That's shown here. I wanna point out that often as you flow through these porous media, these polymers can get ripped apart and they can break. That's important at high flow rates. In our experiments, we observe identical rheologies before and after the experiments. We observe identical flow behavior when we take the solution out and re-inject it. So we don't think that polymer scission plays a role in our experiments. And so we can, of course, do the standard experiment, which is measure the pressure drop for a given imposed flow rate. So here on the y-axis, I'm showing you the pressure drop divided by the length of the medium. And on the x-axis, this is the characteristic pore scale shear rate, which is given by the flow rate per unit area divided by this characteristic pore length scale. Phi here is the porosity. K is the absolute permeability of the medium, which we measure. And so at low flow rates or low shear rates, right, the pressure drop is given by Darcy's law using the shear viscosity of the polymer solution. But as you go to increasing flow rates, we again see this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance. And the question is why? And so we can actually directly watch what's happening at each of these flow rates. So here's an example of a pore, right? So these black circles are the grains surrounding this pore. Here I've picked a pore that looks uh, symmetric. They're typically not uh, as symmetric, just to show you uh, this example. At low flow rates, right, down here, the flow is stable, laminar, unchanging in time. But above this deviation, we find that the flow does become highly unstable. You can see it changes spatially, temporally, even though the Reynolds numbers are always much smaller than one. Right? So we do see the onset of these flow fluctuations characteristic of elastic turbulence above this deviation. So one question is what's happening right at this transition? Right? How does this uh, flow transition to this turbulent state? And so by imaging the flow right at that transition, we found actually that Typically, there's the flow is stable, it's laminar. Here I'm showing you the flow fluctuation. So we take the flow field, we subtract off the stable background flow. So purple here means that it's just stable, unchanging in time. Blue and green and yellow are increasingly unstable flow. And what we see is that just at this transition, we see little bursts of unstable flow that die away, right? They burst and they die away. So you have the stable flow field with additional flow fluctuations intermittently on top of them. If you go to even higher flow rates, we see that these flow fluctuations become more and more prominent and they persist for longer and longer periods of time, right? You can see here, it's even more unstable shown by the green and yellow, right? And it persists over time. So we have a transition between two states, between a stable state and a chaotic state, right? And so here's an example of this chaotic state, a movie showing a high resolution view of this chaotic flow. You can see the flow is highly changing, uh, fluctuating both spatially and temporally. You see these swirls that grow and die away and move around, right? This looks like turbulence, but it's generated by polymer elasticity. And so here's an example of our quantification using particle image velocimetry, where we can map out uh, uh, these vortices and the features of this flow, right? And one key point is we can look at the spectrum of these fluctuations, and they show these characteristic power law decays, indicating a chaotic state. And what's more is that it looks like most of these flow fluctuations are very slow. They occur over time scales much longer than the polymer relaxation time. And that's an important point that will arise again when we model this flow. So one question is how do we describe this transition from the stable state to this chaotic turbulent state, right? So what we do in each pore, we measure how long these bursts of instability persist for. And we measure that as a function of the characteristic Weisenberg number. This is the analog of the Reynolds number, 
but for polymer elasticity. So this is given by the first normal stress difference divided by the shear stress. These are measured from the shear rheology, but calculated at the characteristic shear rate of each different flow rate, All right? And so the punchline is that we can measure this for many different pores. Each color here is a different pore. And for each pore, at low flow rates or low Weisenberg numbers, the pore is stable, laminar, unchanging in time, right? So it's zero here. But then at a critical flow rate, which corresponds to a critical Weisenberg number shown by we see here, right? That pore becomes increasingly unstable, increasingly chaotic until it's fully chaotic and fully turbulent, right? And what's interesting is that different pores transition to this turbulent state at different Weisenberg numbers. So the, this is the distribution of these critical Weisenberg numbers. But when we take the data measured for each pore and rescale them by that characteristic critical Weisenberg number for each pore, they all seem to show a similar universal increase in how unstable they are, right? So even though different pores become unstable at different flow rates or different Weisenberg numbers, the way they become unstable seems to, seems to be generic among all the different pores. So that's really interesting. And so the punchline here is that at low flow rates, these are just three randomly chosen pores. At low flow rates, they're all stable, shown by this purple. Above one flow rate, this first pore starts to become unstable, right? Shown by this yellow and green. These two pores remain stable. And then at an even higher flow rate, the second pore now becomes unstable and chaotic. At an even higher flow rate, this third pore finally becomes unstable, right? So different pores become unstable, become chaotic at different flow rates or different Weisenberg numbers, right? And so the famous French physicist De Gen in uh, uh, describing the coil to stretch transition for polymers, where different polymers stretch out at different flow rates, called that uh, phenomenon molecular individualism. We call this phenomenon porous individualism. Different pores become unstable at different flow rates, right? So what are the consequences of this? This is very interesting from a scientific perspective, but how does this relate to the macroscopic flow resistance? Remember I showed you these data, we wanna explain the shape of this curve, right? These are the pressure drop measurements. So let's recast these pressure drop measurements as an apparent viscosity, as people often do. Again, at low flow rates or low Weisenberg numbers, that apparent viscosity is just given by the shear viscosity. So this normalized quantity is one. But then above a threshold flow rate or a threshold Weisenberg number, that apparent viscosity increases and then seems to actually plateau. Right? And we want to explain the shape of this curve. So what do we do? Well, we were inspired by some simulations from Johan Potting's group, right? And work that people have done in the turbulence community. We said, well, we can actually watch the flow fluctuations at the pore scale. So let's try to connect the energy dissipated by these flow fluctuations to the overall macroscopic pressure drop. So we can consider a steady state power balance, right? Throwing out all inertial terms where the pressure work by the fluid is given by generates viscous dissipation right and so we can integrate over our porous medium and we can make a few assumptions one is that this flow is fluctuating slowly right so we assume a quasi steady flow because we measured that most of the fluctuations are on long time scales and second we can measure how much these polymers are stretched out by in this chaotic flow field. And what we find is that the Henke strain, which is a measure of how stretched out they are, is always much smaller than one, even in these highly chaotic flow fields. And what people have found is that for extensional viscosity to play an appreciable role, the Henke strain has to exceed something like two or three, right? And so it looks like polymer extension is locally driving the onset of this flow instability, but the accumulated stretching of polymers is not a strong contributor to the global dissipation. So we assume that 
polymer doesn't contribute to the extensional viscosity. And this is all a way of motivating what's known as a generalized Newtonian fluid approach. What we can do, taking this power balance, is we can actually relate the overall pressure drop that you would measure, right, so the apparent viscosity, to the viscous dissipation of the background laminar flow field, which just gives you your typical Darcy's law, plus this additional contribution, which is given by the viscous dissipation of these additional chaotic flow fluctuations, right? And so that's given by this quantity chi, which quantifies the rate of added dissipation due to these additional chaotic flow fluctuations. So why is this useful? This formula relates the overall macroscopic flow resistance given by the pressure drop measurements to your typical Darcy's law for the background stable flow field, and we know all these quantities, and an additional piece which we can determine from our flow measurements, right? And so we can actually take the measured flow field, we can quantify the velocity fluctuations, use those to quantify the strain rate associated with those fluctuations, and thereby quantify this additional viscous dissipation, right? And if what I'm telling you is correct, if this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance is indeed given by the additional dissipation due to elastic turbulence. The macroscopic measurements given by this left-hand side should be captured by the pore scale imaging given by this right-hand side. We can measure everything, plug it into this relationship, and lo and behold, these are the apparent viscosity measurements from the macroscopic pressure drop and this is the prediction from this relationship, no fitting parameters directly from the pore scale measured flow field, right? And it does a beautiful job of capturing the onset of this anomal anomalous increase and the shape of this curve. Over here, right, you'll notice that we're throwing out complicated strain history effects of these polymers. Over here, those are likely playing an increasing role, but overall, this simplified generalized Newtonian fluid approach does a very nice job of capturing this on anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance. And what's more is, remember I showed you that porous individualism where different pores become chaotic at different flow rates or different Weisenberg numbers. The shape of that distribution actually controls the shape of this curve. This point here is when the first pores start to become unstable and chaotic. As you increase your flow rate, more and more of those pores become unstable until all of the pores in the medium are now chaotic and unstable. And then it starts to level off and actually decrease as the viscous dissipation of the background laminar flow starts to play more and more, more of a role. So not only can we actually show that by imaging the flow at the pore scale, not only can we demonstrate quantitatively that this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance is due to elastic turbulence, but we can quantify it and we can uh, say something meaningful about the shape of this curve. It reflects the distribution of these critical Weisberg numbers in the porous medium, which we think reflects the geometry of the medium. And so I'm just going to conclude here by pointing out that you can do some back of the envelope calculations, right? This is all in a model 3D porous medium. What about in the field? If you just take your characteristic pore sizes of sandstones or soils, right? And you take your characteristic flow speeds, characteristic polymer relaxation times, which can be quite large. The pore scale Weisenberg numbers in the field are can be as large as 10,000, right? Uh, the critical Weisenberg numbers at which these pores become unstable is something between two and six. And so while other effects like absorption and scission, we think can also play a role in the field, we do expect that what we found here with these elastic instabilities and turbulence will manifest in the field. And so with that, I'm just gonna conclude by summarizing what we found by directly visualizing the flow at the pore scale and measuring the macroscopic flow resistance. We found this transition from stable flow to unstable flow in each pore, right? And it looks like the differences between the different pores in a medium smooth out this transition 
And we've been able to show that the energy dissipated by these flow fluctuations determines this anomalous increase in the macroscopic flow resistance. And so we're excited because not only have we, we think, been able to show that elastic turbulence arises and quantitatively causes this macroscopic flow resistance, but we're excited because this deeper understanding we now have gives principles to try to control this behavior in the field. And so a lot of these results are summarized in this paper on the archive. Please check it out. And I'll also just point out that there are new questions that we're chasing now. What determines those critical Weisenberg numbers at which different pores become unstable? We think it's the pore scale geometry. That's something we're trying to figure out now. What determines the extent of the viscous dissipation? What's the impact of the pore structure? How does the fluid rheology and polymer properties play a role? These are all interesting questions that we're starting to uh, tackle right now. And finally, I'll go back to where we started. I told you about how these high molecular weight polymer solutions are increasingly being used in enhanced oil recovery, right? For decades, people added small molecular weight polymers to um, injection fluids for conformance control, right? Due to its high viscosity to decrease the mobility ratio, increase your sweep efficiency, prevent bypassing, things like that. But people conventionally have thought that you know, polymers aren't really going to do much to enhance the recovery of your trapped oil or whatever other trapped fluid. But 10 years ago, actually, uh, work in China in the De Qing oil field showed that highly elastic polymer solutions can increase the, dis the displacement efficiency much more than you would typically expect, right? The incre incremental recoveries were all more than 20% of the original oil in place above that of water flooding, about double that of conventional viscosity polymer flooding, right? And so people have been using this in China and many other settings. And the question is why? Why do highly elastic polymer solutions increase the amount of trapped fluid that you're getting out? We still don't know, but we think that elastic turbulence, these chaotic flow fluctuations that we found might play a role. And one of the things that we're doing now in my lab, we've developed ways to actually reconstruct the 3D geometry of these trapped uh, droplets, these trapped ganglia of oil inside the pore space. Here's one example. We're starting to now use our imaging to look at how these chaotic flows generated by polymers interact with these trapped fluids and potentially help mobilize them. So we're very excited for the future. With that, I will conclude here. Thank you all for listening. This is my incredible lab who do all the hard work. Um, we're on the web at this uh, website here. Our papers are linked there. If you're interested, please check it out. And we're also on Twitter here. Thank you all. And I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you very much, um, Sujit, for absolutely great and, and fascinating talk. It's always re-inspiring to see what is happening at the poor scale and, and elucidate the, the small scale physics that influence how a reservoir it's kilometers in size behaves. You mentioned over the ports of polymer flooding in China, where I think it was a darching oil feed with 10,000 plus wells when they do polymer right. flooding. Um, it's, it's a massive undertaking. We have some first questions coming through, and I'm going to um, get them up on the screen. And one is actually from someone at Harriet Watch University, um, the poor scale modeler himself. Um, Julian has two questions. So the first one is, thank you for the great presentation. I have two questions. How do you make sure the 3D glass models are fully centered? So that's the first hmm. question. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is something that uh, yeah we've refined our protocols over the years. I mean, we've been doing, you know, I've been doing this for something like 10 plus years now. and um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, when we started, it's like a recipe. It's like a cooking recipe. We, 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 uh, you know, it was a lot of refinement. But essentially, um, you know, we we verify that they're centered, but you also don't want to over center them because that changes the uh, the uh, pore space structure. Um, we verify that they're fully centered first, just by mechanical perturbation. So we tap them and make sure that you know nothing comes out. We can also visualize the actual contacts where they're centered using confocal microscopy and in our you know high pressure flows we also verify that the beads are completely static 
And so um, we've refined the protocols for how to do it. All the full details are in our papers. Um, we put all the full details. So if that's something you would like to do, please check out the method sections of our papers or feel free to email me and I'm happy to help you out. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna sneak in um, a little question myself. So what is the resolution that you can get um, with your imaging? So uh, yeah. notice I may have missed this. There was, there was no scale on, on the pores. So is it tens of microns, 100 microns down to micron scale? Yeah, so, so um, you know, for the work that I showed you today, um, our pores were, uh, you know, our, the, the, the bead diameters are 300 microns around. So the uh, pore sizes are on the order of tens of micrometers. Um, the imaging resolution, you know, because we're using confocal microscopy, which is an optical based approach. So typically you're diffraction limited, which means the imaging resolution is on the order of hundreds of nanometers. However, we have developed approaches, um, you know, that rely on various um, uh, uh, forms of deconvolution and post-processing where we can actually try to get sub 100 nanometer resolution depending on the application. Um, so typically the imaging resolution is on the order of tens or hundreds of nanometers. Um, yeah, in, in, in what we image. And we've, you know, in the other work that we've done, looking at colloids and other kinds of polymers and immiscible fluids and just typical uh, simple fluids, we've uh, looked at porous media where the pore sizes are as small as, um, uh, you know, hundreds of nanometers, several micrometers, all the way up to hundreds of microns. So we have a pretty broad range in terms of the porous media that we can fabricate as well as the imaging that we can do. And the nice thing about this imaging is not only can we go down to the sub pore scale, but we can also, you know, image over the entire porous medium and really kind of do connect uh, the features of the flow at multiple scales. And do you have any questions with the PIV, with the particle image velocimetry in working in 3D um, or is that that's, I mean, that, that's, that's a great question. So everything that I showed you today, right, we're looking at a 2D slice within a 3D porous medium. We can um, obtain those 2D flow fields at different depths, certainly. Getting that third component is something that we've started to work to do. Um, there are ways to do it. It, uh, you know, either computationally by, you know, assuming essentially mass conservation, um, you can try to reconstruct that third component or alternatively, there are um, imaging approaches, for example, using holography, where you can try to get the third component or just put an additional lens that uh, images from the side. But for everything that we've done so far, we've just been looking at 2D cuts of a three-dimensional flow field. And um, because we're looking fairly deep in, you know, away from the boundaries, um, the flow is fairly isotropic. So, you know, the, the because we're looking at the statistics of the flow, we've been able to learn a lot just from those 2D slices, but obtaining the full 3D velocity field would be super cool. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Julian's second question, sorry for interrupting his two questions. So his second question is, have you investigated the impact of really high roughness maybe ah. in 2D micromotor experiments? Yeah, that's a great question. Short answer is no. Um, you know, so one of the things that we've, Although I think that is very interesting. So one of the things, you know, and it's uh, it's really fun because we are already getting so much rich dynamics and, you know, we're already getting so much mileage out of these simplified model systems of, you know, smooth beads, packings of beads. Um, but that is something that we've gotten very interested in because, of course, roughness and various forms of heterogeneity are inherent in real uh, rocks and other porous media. So one of the things that we've done is not only just using spherical glass beads, but you can use crushed glass where it's not rough, but you have you know sharp edges that kind of are more uh, close to typical uh, uh, porous rocks. And then also for roughness, there are various chemical treatments that you can use to roughen the surface of the glass. That's something that others have done. We haven't done much with that, but that is something we are certainly interested in. And of course, in 2D micromodels, that's um, much more straightforward. And we do a lot of 2D stuff as well. Thank you. So the question is starting to come in quite quickly. Um, and this is actually 
um, from Sadi Pavuluri, um, Julian's former PhD student. Um, this is great work, Sujit. Do you try investigating the polymer resistivity at different temperatures as well, or do you plan to do this in the future? Ah, that's a great question. I mean, there are so many different, you know, interesting questions and uh, uh, only, you know, 24 hours in the day, but that is an interesting question. So far, we've, um, everything we've done has uh, been at room temperature. We have hacked our microscope to be able to um, do these investigations over a broader range of uh, temperatures. Uh, one of the things that we're in, in, interested to do is indeed try to access conditions that are more akin to you know, reservoir temperatures and pressures, um, but we haven't done anything on that yet. It's a great question. And then um, similar question along those lines. Um, yep. You use a PZ channel. I don't know who is behind that, that acronym. Apologies for that. Is there minimum concentration at which fluctuations are observed? The great same question. question crossed my mind. Yeah. yeah, great question. Yes. And so that's, and, and, you know, there's a lot of really deep physics buried into this, um, how we've parameterized this problem. So I told you about this Weisenberg number, right? And I uh, said that you need to exceed a critical Weisenberg number to see these flow fluctuations. So the question is, what sets that critical Weisenberg number? And so, you know, I, I kind of breeze through the definition quickly, but the Weisenberg number essentially is related to the polymer solution properties, right? It's, um, it's rheology. And so um, there is, you do need a sufficient concentration and a sufficiently high molecular weight of the polymer for, you know, to reach that, to hit that critical Weisenberg number, as well as a sufficiently high flow rate. So they all kind of play together in uh, determining what the Weisenberg number is. So in short, yes, there is, you know, a threshold concentration, threshold molecular weight, threshold flow rate, above which these flow fluctuations will arise. Um, there, I can't just say there's one threshold concentration. It depends on the molecular weight and the imposed flow rate. So they're all coupled together, but that's what the Weisenberg number quantifies together. I hope that answers your question. In short, yes, there is a critical concentration as well as molecular weight and flow rate. And those all come into this Weisenberg number, which we've used to quantify this, uh, this, this transition. So we just, um, thank you, Sujit. So just um, saw that um, PZ is actually Patsali Sita, one of our former oh, speakers yeah, from okay. Delft. Um So great to have you. Yeah, that, well, uh, that's a huge Patsali honor. Back yeah, on, in my opinion, that's a legend uh, that we've been inspired by uh, many of uh, Zita's papers. So th thank you for the question. So. So on that um, on that very kind note um, and uh, about Pacelli, here's a second question: Did you really prove Demin Wang's conjecture? Uh huh. Uh, so just just to clarify, I think the conjecture being that um, elastic el elasticity induced uh, flow fluctuations um, enhance the mobilization of oil. Is that is that the uh, the conductor or well that's that's yeah. where we with a with a one-way channel <laughs> traffic yeah, 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 yeah. Bit, well, um, yeah. so let's assume that this is what yeah. what Pacelli meant and yeah. um Pacelli, if, if you're wrong um just yes yeah. that's so that's what he meant oh. yes okay great the short answer is no we did not that's where we're headed next everything that I told you about right is just for a single phase we did not have um trapped uh, immiscible fluid yet we've done uh, work with trapped immiscible fluids and in, in other contexts but even just a single phase flow of the polymer solution is surprisingly complicated and rich and interesting right it was it was really shocking to us when we started this project it was really shocking to us that this very basic question what is the apparent viscosity of a polymer solution in, in a porous medium even that very simple descriptor, we didn't have a good answer to, right? And so that really is what motivated this project. Um, and so now we think we have better understanding of that single phase flow. And so the next step, of course, is to address that conjecture by looking at the coupling to an invisible phase. I think the answer is yes. You know, that's, that's uh, my, my guess is that conjecture is correct but we don't have the uh, evidence for it yet. That's where what we're testing right now. And so stay tuned. <laughs>
We will. We need to have you back then uh, yep. for talk in the future. <laughs> Phil, I see you unmuted yourself. That looks like you want to sneak in I a question. I, I, I can't possibly avoid asking a question. That's, that's impossible while I have uh, the power to switch my own microphone. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about pores and pore shapes, and you didn't mention pore throats or, or things between pores very much. So I was wondering uh, yeah, what impact you thought you thought that had. So I think that it has a huge impact. When I say pore shape, I'm kind of, um, that is that is my kind of way of uh, subsuming a lot of really important geometric features, such as, for example, the aspect ratio between the pore throats and the pore bodies and the connectivity of the pores and, and various other geometric characteristics. Um, that's kind of what I was referring to as pore shape. Now, um, one of the things that we did, I referenced an earlier JFM paper that um, we put out last year, where what you know to address the question of oh well thank you uh, 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 Zita just uh, just posted a comment thank you um, so um, one of the things that we did is we microfabricated pore arrays where we could tune the spacing between the pores to try to get at this question of aspect ratio and what one of the things that we found is that um, there's a competition between the time it takes to get from one pore throat to the next downstream pore throat and the time it takes for elastic stresses due to stretching out these polymers to relax. And so, you know, if uh, the polymer can get from one pore constriction to another without fully relaxing, then you get really interesting complex uh, uh, flow dynamics. Whereas if it can relax, then you can kind of treat the different uh, pores in isolation. So that was kind of the big result that we showed in that JFM paper that we published last year. However, um, there are so many other aspects of pore geometry, as you pointed out, that we're starting to tackle now. Um, Simon Howard uh, and Amy Shen put this paper out recently on the archive where they pointed at the importance of stagnation points in the flow, which again, are very sensitive to the pore geometry, however you might want to characterize that, um, whether or not stagnation points do arise, where they arise, and stagnation points are places where polymers can get stretched out quite a lot. And so that's another kind of piece of this puzzle. But the short answer is we don't know how pore geometry broadly defined impacts the features of this flow. And that's part of what we're trying to do now is systematically tuning the geometric characteristics and seeing how that impacts um, these critical Weisenberg numbers. Does that answer your question, Phil? That does, that does, yeah. And there are lots of questions. I need to, I need to sort of sneak in quick comment here because if you, if you could, the, the poor scale feature, the poor scale geometries, that's something yeah. we can get from routine core analysis. Yep. If you have your critical Weisenberg number and you can get this relationship sorted, then you can almost estimate how well a pore, uh, polymer flood would work in your favorite oil reservoir, ground water mediation. Um, so that's a really practical application, isn't it? Exactly. That's part of what we're excited about. I mean, you know, we started out just trying to get at the, that's a great point, Sebastian. We started, you know, just trying to get a deeper understanding of the fundamentals of this. But what we found is that distribution of critical Weisenberg numbers is really what sets, uh, sets the shape of that curve. And indeed, you know, it helps rationalize experiments that um, Andy Clark's group has done and uh, several others where, you know, you can imagine as you make those more ordered, that'll be a sharper transition because that distribution of onset Weisenberg numbers will be tighter. Perhaps if it's more poly dispersed, that'll be smoother, you know, but you're completely right that if you can um, connect pore geometry, which you can just get from core analysis to that distribution of critical Weisenberg numbers, then you can input that into the model that we came up with and capture that overall curve. Mm -hmm. That'll be really exciting. And that's part of why we're trying to tease out the influence of core geometry to kind of put that on a more rigorous footing. But that's that's the dream. Right, thank you. I've talked too many questions myself. I'm just I'm sort of slowly running out of, my, out of time. So I just want to pick up two further questions here. Um, so the first one is from Hussaini Nassab. Have you seen shear thickening behavior? If so, what was the cause of that observation? 
Um, that's a good question. So one thing I'll just mention, uh, you know, just you, you said there are several uh, other questions. I would be, you know, anyone who has questions that I can't address in the time here, please feel free to reach out to me by email. I'd happy to continue to interact Thank with you, you all uh, offline. So about shear thickening, no. So we, it depends how you define shear thickening, but if you mean the typical, you know, you take your solution, put it in a rheometer, measure the shear rheology, the viscosity goes up above, uh, you know, at high shear rates, we have not seen that. Typically, uh, these polymer solutions do not exhibit shear thickening, they exhibit shear thinning. But in a porous medium, they exhibit an apparent thickening. And that's kind of the puzzle. Um, other, you know, complex fluids do exhibit shear thickening, but for everything that we've looked at here with these polymer solutions, no, they don't. Okay. Give the last question to Julian, um, and he asks: Are elastic turbulence likely to result in droplet fragmentation, leading to increased recovery? Is there a link with reactive precipitation and self-feeling fluids? Okay, that's 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 a great. Two, I would, I'm going to treat them as two separate questions. The first question: um, It's an interesting point. Short answers, I don't know. This is part of what we're looking at now: is the interactions with a uh, with trapped immiscible droplets. Actually, you know, I don't know if droplet fragmentation would lead to increased recovery. You know, when you fragment droplets, they get smaller. So the, the viscous pressure drop across each droplet is smaller. So you actually go, need to go to higher flow rates to be able to push them through. So, and whether or not fragmentation actually happens, I don't, you know, due to the uh, chaotic flow fluctuations, I don't know. That's part of what we're uh, investigating right now. And then that second question, um, I'm sorry, Sebastian, I missed it. It, it was rela related to reactive transport. Yes, let me just bring this back again. Um, is there a link with reactive precipitation and self healing fluids? Yeah, that's it. I'm not sure. That's not something I've thought too much about, to be, okay. to be honest. I, I, um, Julian, if you have any thoughts, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, we've been thinking about how these flow fluctuations due to polymers can help um, improve, uh, you know, homogenize, um, you know, for example, solute transport and improve dispersion and things like that. Um, what the implications are for reactions and um, self-healing, uh, as you mentioned, I'm not sure, but I'd be happy to chat more about that. Well, then this is the third talk coming once. Yeah, once there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so we have we have booked <laughs> you for the for the next years. <laughs> so uh, time is more than up. Um, Normally, Hardy gives her the, the the closing remarks. I don't know if you want to do this, Phil, or um, if I put you on the on the yeah, spot. I otherwise, can, I can. I, I I can give a go. I uh, I, I didn't quite expect that, but that's uh, that's always good. Yeah, <laughs> on the spot. Just making things. So well, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, I don't look too much at poor scale modeling. I'm more from the sort of the global sense. So I learned a fantastic amount today, and uh, especially. Um, uh, the, the imaging and the quality of the imaging you can get really within the flow of the the pore space i, I was really impressed and uh, and i anticipate the other two talks that uh, you're going to give that sebastian's already wrote you in for so I'll, I'll certainly tune in and look for those so i think the only thing that's left is to, to thank you on behalf of uh, not just sebastian myself uh, uh, and hadi but also on the whole of the audience and the people that you answered uh, all of their questions so it was a pleasure to listen to you and uh, thank you very much for your talk well, thank you for having me here. Thank you, everyone. And I look forward to interacting with all of you more. Yeah, so again, thank you from my side as well, Sujit, for an absolutely great talk. Um, really you know, fascinating insights. Um, I've, I've learned a lot about things I haven't really um, understood, thought about that before, much before. Absolutely great. Um, I think there are quite a few things in my group. Um, Julian is working with me very closely. I see our co um, collaboration opportunities, so expect some emails coming from through from us. Um, thank you to the audience for some great questions, and um, we see you all next week. For actually, the first returning speaker, so Chris Spears, is going to give a, a second talk in um, that series. Um, so we have the first report speaker, hopefully others to come in the future as well. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day from wherever you are. Stay safe, stay happy, and um, see you in a week's time then in the same all place. Bye-bye, right. everyone. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Phil.